All game right. mechanics. Game mechanics. Yeah. yeah. Everyone loves game mechanics. The word. Is, yeah. The word is thrown out all the time. Phrase. Whatever. Right. What is a game mechanic? Anybody? No. No one, no one even raised their hand. One so, guy's trying, but we're not going to let him answer. We're I mean, in a first-person shooter, like, is shooting a mechanic? Is, like, gun collection a mechanic? Is just an entire game a mechanic? What if I play a game, and that game determines who plays the next game? Right? So, what is a game mechanic? The fact is, if you look on the internet, if you try to look at research and books and Wikipedia, right, the definitions for game mechanic are so vague as to include so many unrelated things or they're so varied that you can't tell which one is the right one. I've seen things like dice is a game mechanic. Well, I guess so. It's not that interesting to talk about just right. dice as a game mechanic. Right, but something else like, you know, physics could be a game mechanic, right? Just some sort of crazy physics game, right? It's like, well... Or even like Half-Life 2. I mean, physics is a game mechanic in Half-Life 2. The puzzles, you know, there's a levering board. You've got to stand on it and then walk up it. Right, or sometimes an entire game could be a mechanic of another game. So it's... How do you really talk about game mechanics if you don't, you can't really separate them into any particular category, right? So for the purpose of this discussion, and at least in my mind, I see a game mechanic as, so you know, and this is a tabletop theater also, so we're going to focus on tabletop, but of course it applies to all games, right? Uh, is a set of rules that sort of form a new rule, be, you know, uh, unto themselves, right? So if you really break a game down into these smallest bits, you know, like the rules of rolling dice would be like, pick up the die, shake it up a bunch, throw it, but then, look at it. The number of dots that is face up is this number, right? And But at the same time, there's the distinction. I mean, there are actions you take in the course of a game that aren't mechanical in the sense that they don't affect the game. The fact that I have to look at the value on the die isn't a mechanic. Like, if I forget to look at it, I don't get to move in Monopoly. That's not how it works. Mm -hmm. But, for example, rolling a die and then moving a guy forward is a set of rules. You roll a die and then you move, right? It's a set of rules that create this mechanic of roll your dice, move your mice. And we can just tell people, hey, in this game you roll your dice, move your mice. We don't need to explain all these sub-rules, right, of that. It's a mechanic. It's a, it's a combination of rules that form a mechanism that is a piece of a larger game. All right, so let us explore some many game mechanics. And for each game mechanic, we're going to tell you, A, if you're a player, what you should do when you encounter this game mechanic, and B, if you're a game maker, when you should use it and how you should use it and how you should think about it, right? So the number one most obvious game mechanic in the entire universe is taking turns. Now, this might seem self-evident, but really it's not. The idea of taking turns is not in all games, and it's not even that intuitive. Yeah, let's soccer. Do you take turns in soccer? No, you just play for a long time, and then it's over. <laughs> Meanwhile, football, football, you take turns. I mean, one team's turn is to be on offense. There's a way to interrupt that turn, but it is, it is their turn to score. Volleyball, it's my turn to score as opposed to your turn. Yeah, and turn. there's so many variations on taking turns. It could be... Everyone takes a simultaneous turn. It could be we go around in a circle taking turns. It could be the turn order changes. It could be, you know, one person takes a bunch of turns, right? You could baseball, you know, you have a bunch of turns on one team then a bunch of turns on the other team. It's, it's crazy all over the place. Now, we're not even just talking about ortho games, meaning like straight standard games, like a game of chess or Puerto Rico where players play to win. In an RPG, there's RPGs like Mouse Guard where you take turns. It's the game master's turn, then the player's turn. Dungeons and Dragons doesn't work like that. Nope. Dungeons and Dragons doesn't have turns at all. All right, so if you're a player, right, how do you need to think about taking turns, right? Well, the first thing you really need to think about that's most important is the lefty-righty, right? In most games, a player that takes their turn before you, you know, especially if there's more than two players, right, will be able to affect you in some way. And a player that goes after you, you'll usually be able to do something to them simply because of the fact that you go before they do, right? So if a guy goes before me, he can do something to interrupt you know, what I'm about to do and mess with me, right? So when you're going to sit down at the table, if you know the game is clockwise, you know, look at who's sitting where. Make now, sure the really powerful guy is on the left and the really weak guy is on the right. This proves problematic. You might wonder, why do so many games go clockwise? <coughs> the only reason games go clockwise, and that's the order of play, is because that's easy for people to remember. That is the only reason. And a lot of games are actually really unbalanced as a result. We would play El Grande, which is this bidding game, but once you bid on your position for turn order, then everything else just went clockwise. And the problem with that was that once you realize it, you want to sit to the left of someone or the right of someone, and we would stand around the table like, you want to play El Grande? Sure. I'm just waiting for someone to sit down. 
We started having to play another game to figure out where we'd sit in El Grande because the game didn't take this into account. Yeah. There's a thing you can get called Shocking Roulette. It's a pretty popular gaming device. Everyone puts their finger in and one person gets shocked and that's how you know who goes first. <laughs> and you can use this multiple times to create a turn order if necessary. Uh, which means everyone but one person will get shocked, which is pretty fun. Now one thing to really think about as a player is some games give you a way to change the turn order. Like in Kalis, someone can use, I think, the Provost to jump whatever building it is. A way. You can go on this building and change the turn order. Now I get to go first. Any time a game lets you spend in-game resources to change the turn order, the game is telling you that turn order is really important to winning. So if you're a game maker, right, how do you decide how to use this taking turns thing, right? And really the big development in the tabletop world that's happened, you know, in terms of taking turns and the design of them in games is that we went from games where each player did a whole bunch of stuff on their turn and the other people waited, right? Like war games, you know, one person does a whole bunch of stuff, move all my guys, attack, 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 do all this stuff. And then now it's your turn, right? You play rigging samurai swords or, you know. Ikusa, Shogun, it's all the it's same. All the same game. It's or, like, yeah, the game only takes four turns. Yeah, the turn takes four or hours. Axis and and Scott's turn in that turn takes a full hour. Right. So now, modern games, what they do is if they have turn taking at all, they do lots and lots of little turns, right? When you play Eclipse, it's like, I move. And the next guy researches, and the next guy builds, and the next guy moves, and the next guy, right? You're going around doing lots of little things. Ticket to ride, it's your turn. You can take cards, which takes two seconds. You can build trains, which takes a few more seconds. You can take routes, you almost never do that, maybe once a game, right? And that also doesn't take very long at all. So it's take trains, take trains, take trains, build trains, take trains. It goes around really fast. Right? And that's a modern game design. People aren't bored at the table. Right? So more modern, newer uh, tabletop games are much more popular. Now at the same time, there's a lot of subtlety there. In a game where Scott's turn takes a long time, on my turn, I can spend that time thinking and planning my turn more or less depending on how the game's designed. Some games don't let you do this. They don't give you enough information to when it's not your turn, make a reasonable plan or decision. Like Alhambra is a great game. But you can't do anything when it's not your turn. If you try to plan your turn, someone's going to take that tile. Guaranteed. So you basically have to sit there and ignore the game until it's your turn and then take your turn. But if you design a game, you can think about that. Do you want players to be able to plan their turn ahead of time? If so, you need to give them the information necessary to make those decisions. If you do this, even very complex games will move a lot quicker. Games that do this poorly take forever, not just because the turns take a long time, but because every player is starting from scratch at the beginning of their turn. Now, even more subtly, you might even not want to do that. Alhambra actually works as a game because you don't want players planning when it's not their turn. Why would you do that? Why would you want players to not have any ability to plan on their turn? So they don't have to think too hard? <laughs> now, not having to think too hard means they can socialize. Sometimes, some crazy people, we're not these crazy people, they're probably not in this room, but there's people out there who like to talk to people and have fun while they're playing a game. Now, I'm not that way. I'm looking at the Puerto Rico board like, all right, if Scott captains three turns from now, I'll win if this and this and this happen. <laughs> but a game like Alhambra, the turns are very quick, and you cannot plan when it's not your turn. As a result, when you're taking your turn, you're out of the game for maybe 10 seconds, 20 seconds while you take your turn. Everyone else is just socializing and hanging out. So the game becomes more social. If you're designing a game, the way turn taking works has a huge impact on whether or not people will talk to each other during your game. All right, let's move on, because we spend that much time on every one of these, we're going to be not finishing. Because right. every one of these is really complicated. I know, it's really good. Okay, so the next one, racing. You think ra right? racing's pretty simple. Whoever gets to the end first wins, right? And you might think, you know, racing, you might think race cars, bike racing, running racing, is just go as fast as possible. That's the strategy, right? Well, not necessarily, right? A lot of times, going slower is better. This is uh, Formula D, or Formula Day, uh, as it was previously known. And in this game, you gotta go slow because you have to stop a certain number of times in each corner to prevent from crashing. And if you don't, out of the game. That's right. So, you know, it's like you basically risk getting kicked out of the game if you go too fast. Uh, the thing is, right, is I think it was uh, Porsche, you know, Mr. Porsche, right, who said the perfect race car will go over the finish line and then explode, right? Just Blues fall, Brothers style. Yeah, fall apart in a heap, right? Is in a lot of these racing games, is you know, if you expend resources, you know, your tires wear out, your, you know, you you you've run out of fuel, right? You basically have to bring it to the edge. It's like, 
I'll go faster around this corner. You know, if I don't stop, you know, one more time in this corner, I'm going to take some damage. And it's like, well, if you think of those damages as spend all of them except for one, the one that will make your car explode before the end of the race. If you try to prevent all damage, you're going to go too slow, right? You're not going to make it. Now, racing is a mechanic that exists within a lot of other games. Like, Power Grid sort of has the race to victory points, the race to fill out places. Obviously, it's a little more abstract, but even then, look what happens. If you end your turn and you've got one or two Electros as opposed to zero, you probably played suboptimally. You could have done something to where you could have spent those Electros. You'll notice players who win Power Grid more often end their turn with either zero or a whole bunch every single turn. Pay attention to that. Those players know what they're doing. Also, things that don't appear to be races are races. Any board game you play where it's like, whoever, the game is over when someone gets 100 points. Like, Vinci was like that. That's a race. It doesn't look like a race because you're not physically running. You know, you can't see that you're ahead of someone, but it is a race. Now, Vinci is the game that Small World became. Small World is based on Vinci. Oh, okay, so yeah, anyone. Anyway. I don't think anyone would, no one knows Vinci anymore. Yeah, 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 anyway. You should, if you, if you like Small World, you should play Vinci once if you can find a copy just to see what the differences are. Uh, it's pretty interesting. There are some misprints and errata and stuff like that. All right, so if you're a game designer, you're making a game, when would you put in a race? The when you put in a race is when you want to test how well the players can, deter, can calculate efficiency. Right? If it's just you know, a game where someone wins by you know, defeating the opponent, efficiency might not matter. Someone might be able to play a very long I game. I can build a whole lot of Zerg. Right. <laughs> it's like, you know, there's, no, there's no time limit here. This thing is only going to end when it ends. Maybe a fighting, you know, I guess fighting games usually have a, a clock. But let's say you had a fighting game where there's no time limit, right? Well, I don't need to be efficient. I can be super defensive and you just wait until I you know, get their last hit point. And there's, there's no rush here, no time limit, no nothing, right? It's not going to end. Uh, but if you want to say we need to force these players to find a way to do, you know, to make them find a more efficient path instead of the slow build, which is really easy to come up with, then you need to put some sort of race in your game. If there's no ending, no, no way to push people forward that they need to reach there on time, then they're not going to, right? It's like, oh, I don't have to. Now, making a good racing mechanic, you need some way for the people behind to feel like they're catching up. Now, I say feel like because... And this is kind of an advanced topic, but basically, there's no such thing as catch-up mechanisms in games. If you could catch up, you weren't actually behind, you just didn't understand the actual state of the game. Right, and the best way to explain this is think about Mario Kart, right? You look at Mario Kart, and you look at who's winning, and it says, first place, Mario, second place, Luigi, third place, Princess, right? Okay, it says Mario first place, we're on lap two out of three. Who is really in first place? It's not Mario. It says he's in first place, but he's not actually in first place because Blue Shell. Everyone knows Blue Shell's coming. Now you'll see advanced players in games like this, it's called a positional heuristic, a way to figure out where you actually are, who's actually winning. People who win games like Mario Kart are playing with their own complex heuristic. They know who's really winning. They're not paying attention to first, second, third. That's the guy who hangs in back and power grid the whole game and then a rubber bands into the front at the very end. Right. So it looks like a catch-up mechanism, right? When Luigi wins that race from second, it's like, oh, he caught up, right? No, he was in first place the whole time. You were just incorrectly calculating who was in first. Now, that's all well good in theory, but in practice, catch-up mechanisms basically do exist. And a good example of this is in a racing game, you want players to have the ability to risk more for greater reward at any point. That way, any player who's falling behind will take ever-increasing risks to be able to catch up. Right. You look at, you know, American football, right? It's like, oh shit, there's like 30 seconds left in the game. Uh, you know, we just scored, but we need some more points to actually win this. Let's go crazy. Onside kick, guys, right? <laughs> uh, let's, you know, let's do a Hail Mary. There's all these crazy things you can try that are very high risk. They're probably not going to work, but you can, you, there's a way you can make it. Go for it, right? Now, they serve three purposes. One, if you want to win games... Always add randomness and always take extra risks when you're behind or you think you're behind. That is the best chance you've got of catching up. Two, these add excitement. If I'm watching football and an onside kick happens, holy crap, that is awesome. Especially if it succeeds, which is, oh yeah, that's <laughs> great. All right, let's move on. The rondel, something that is rarely seen. Who here knows and has never seen the word rondel before? Okay. Oh, nice. I expect it. Yeah, well, it's the tabletop theater. I guess, right? Okay, so this is from a game called Antiki, right? And the way this works is you can only move uh, between one and three steps, and each of these is a different action, right? So if I'm the green guy, right, I can go, I can, on my next turn, I can do gold, maneuver, or farming. 
but I can't do marble know-how maneuver, that other maneuver, iron or temple, right? So you sort of, if you go slowly, you can do all the things, and if you go quickly, it's like you're limited on what you can do in your next turn. So what this causes is a cycle in the game, right? You've got sort of, you know, this, this cycle of you do these things, then you do these things, then you do these things, then you do these things. Now games all have cycles. You'll see this when you play Power Grid or any game, like now people are buying houses, now they're doing this other thing. But this does, it not only enforces the cycle, but it reinforces it. It shows you, hey, the cycle is here. You don't have to figure it out. The important part of this game is everything but this rondel. Mm -hmm. Because everyone sees the same rondel. They know the ebb and flow. Right. There's a lot of other games, though, that also have rondels. Uh, I think uh, Seasons is a pretty hot game right now that has a, a, a rondel that goes around. Yep. And it, as the seasons change, the different types of energy tokens become more common and more rare. One could argue that in the Dune board game, the Sandstorm, is players affect how rapidly it moves around it, the board, wiping everything out. It's definitely a rondel. It goes all the way around the board, killing everything in its path, the Sandstorm. So people are constantly running away from it. So you can see any place that's near the Sandstorm is a weak area, and anything that's behind it is a very very strong area to go into so you gotta see where the spice drops right so when you're playing a game and you see a rondel what you need to do is you need to basically on your turn you know instead of looking at your current situation what you have you need to say how can I line up what I have with the movement of this circle right I need to be up when it's up and down when it's down you know when if you're playing Agricola which sort of has a, a cycle even though it doesn't have a physical rondel right it has the harvest and then a new phase and then a harvest right you got to have the food go up at the harvest and then down after the harvest if your food if you're baking you know if you're sowing during the harvest round and you're not going to get that bake action till after it you're, you're, you're shifted away. It's not a good situation. Now, mechanically, when these rondels exist, like Agricola, the cycle is set. The harvest happens at a set time no matter what. Typically, when someone designs a rondel, the rondel is variable by the players. Players have input into how quickly or slowly the rondel moves. Let's speed up, let's slow down. If you want to be good at rondels, usually I say you don't need to do math, you just need heuristics. You need to kind of figure out intuitively how to play. With rondels, do modulus math in your head. Learn how to do it quickly in your head. I'm not joking. It's really easy to do. You can calculate out where it's going to be or where it could be for the next two or three turns into the future. And then you look at the other players. Oh, Scott really needs to maneuver, so I know he's going to push the thing over there, so I know how the rest of the board is going to look. Well, I mean, I think the way this rondel is... Yeah, this rondel doesn't actually work you in can, sense. You can always maneuver, because there's two of them, I think, right? Is but like anywhere? the Sandstorm I guess if, you're Doom, all, if you just maneuvered, you can't maneuver again. The Sandstorm and Doom, players decide by setting numbers right. collectively how fast or how slow it moves. Yeah. So in a game like that, you know, you can either shift your play to line up with the existing cycle, or you can shift the cycle itself to line up with whatever you, your current situation is. Uh, if you're a game designer and you want to put a rondel in your game, you totally should because there's not enough rondel games. Oh my god. I want this word to be I love, out there. Uh, love rondel so much. We uh, saw that game Antique years ago and we're like, what's this spinner looking thing? And we were just obsessed with it. Yeah. Game's yeah. not that good though. Usually <laughs> rondels are very good for when you want to have phases in your game and you want to sort of have you know, a, a, another, a cycle within the phases, right? So like the game itself, everyone's building up, right? But as they build up, it's like they need to get resources and spend them and get resources and spend them or you know get resources and use them in a different way right and when you want to physically allow players to do what we just said to you know shift that cycle to line up with how they're playing uh, you know then you should put a rondel in there to visualize it and it's totally fun now simultaneously you're doing this when you don't want the game to be about players figuring out that there is a cycle or figuring the cycle out on their own you're giving it to them and telling them use this to optimize the rest of your game yeah, if you're not gonna, if, you're, if the cycle is gonna be set in place, like you know Agricola, right? Their harvests are here, 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 and here. End of story. Then Rondel is no good. Okay, gambling. Yeah, money. Woo. Okay, so obviously everyone knows what gambling is, right? If you're playing gambling, any gambling of any kind, what do you do? It's just really brain dead simple. You just know what the odds are. If you don't know what the odds are and don't really understand probability properly, like you're buying lottery tickets or something, then do not gamble ever <laughs> with real money or not real money. But gambling happens even outside of casinos. There's plenty of you know board games that you play or even video games that are gambling. That you just don't realize that they are gambling. Right? Some of them are really obvious, like what was that horse racing game we played? Oh my god, I don't even know what that was called. You yeah. just roll dice and move horses around, and then one of them wins. Yeah, you just literally just bet on these horses with fake Monopoly you know, game money, and then you win game money, and then so whoever is yeah. the winner. Um, it's actually a really fun game. <laughs> uh, 
because uh, you're not using real money. But you know, there's there's plenty of other times you know where it's just you know okay, I'm playing this you know card. I know there's a 30% chance that this card will do this thing that I really need, and there's a 50% chance that thing will go, but that one costs more. So would you bet a dollar on a 30% chance or five dollars on a 50% chance? And it's like, do you know which one of those is better? You know, and like we said before, if it's early game and you're winning, play conservatively. If it's late game and you're losing, onside kick, do the crazy move. Right? That is a very low percentage chance of uh, succeeding. Right? If you're a game designer, when do you put gambling in games? When your players don't understand probabilities. Because if, <laughs> right? if the players understand probabilities and you put gambling in there, the game will be very, very boring. Because everyone will just know what the optimal move is with the greatest odds of success and do it over and over and over again. Now there is a counterexample to that, as Scott pointed out. This horse racing game that we actually really enjoyed playing was a dumb, it was just a gambling game. It was basically a glorified roulette table. But because that game really focused on the sort of social elements, it was a fun game to play. It just wasn't a good <laughs> game in terms of you know, any sort of strategic thinking. You're not going to feel like you played, well, Monopoly is a terrible example. It was a terrible game. But like Puerto Rico or El Grande or one of these you know, really, even chess, you're not going to get that feeling, but you're still going to have fun. Gambling is really good to use in light games or quick games or games where you don't really, no one really cares who wins. Like they want to win, but they're not going to talk about that time they won. So games that are just fun, that you're going to play for 20 minutes in the expo hall with some dude and then go off somewhere else in the con, that is where you use gambling. I mean, even the game we played yesterday, Skyline, had a, where you roll these dice to build buildings and the building pieces are the dice, right? That had a huge element of gambling. I was like, well, I'm rolling this die. There's a one in six chance. It'll come up as, you know, give me a lot of points. If it doesn't come up that way, I'm going to give it and someone else is going to get that die and have a greater chance of... Now you were winning and then Frank pulled a Hail Mary and rolled this crazy roll and he was winning. And then I pulled another Hail Mary, one right. in a million shot, and I was winning. That game got really exciting. Gambling adds excitement mm -hmm. because you don't know how it's going to end up. Yeah. The number one game mechanic in the entire game. Let's play universe. right now. All right. I win. All right, so rock, paper, scissors. Now, when we say rock, paper, scissors, we're not talking about the game. Oh, well, we are talking about the game rock, paper, scissors. But basically, there are tons and tons and tons of rock, paper, scissors, scissors, scissors. Hey, in almost every game that you play, ever. Starcraft. Right? World of Warcraft. Anything with a, almost, like, it's hard to think, Stratego. Uh, very, almost any game you think of has a rock, paper, scissors going on somewhere within it. Though it's not just a three way, right? It's like one of those thousand way rock, paper, scissors is that there is, you know? Where it's like, well, you know, this tank is strong against that aircraft because it has extra armor, but that helicopter is strong against the tank, right? Uh, Fire Emblem's a great one, right? Axe beats spear, spear beats sword, I think, and sword beats axe. I play Advanced Wars. I know nothing of your Fire yeah, Emblem. I, I hope I'm right, but Fire Emblem has the sword. <laughs> Spear. There's cameras. The right, he's is, nodding. I'm right. Good. I yeah. was going to say, the internet's about to rage on you. <laughs> I had it right, right? It's, it's rock, paper, scissors. So when you encounter a rock, paper, scissors in a game, right, the first thing you have to do is recognize that it is a rock, paper, scissors, right? Number two, you have to determine what kind of rock, paper, scissors it is. Sometimes it's the simultaneous reveal. Like, you don't know it's, you know, you don't know what the other guy's yep. got. Sometimes you know what the other guy's got. Fire Emblem. I see that guy standing there holding a sword. I wonder what he's got. I will send my axe guy over here, spear guy, whatever it is. Right? You, you know what to use on that guy. So it's like, Rim, it'll play that way. All right, I've thrown. No, you have to show it to me. No. Because it's obvious. No, you got to send a scout and get it. I'm not showing you shit. <laughs> if there's a scout using it, it's probably a good idea. Right? Because it's basically fine. But the real thing you have to do is you have to know the whole chart, right? Memorization is the number one thing going on. When there's only rock, paper, and scissors, everyone in this room knows which one beats which one. When there's 10,000 different military units, right, simply knowing which one beats which one is this huge memorization task, right? And when there's way too many of them, like in a lot of complicated games, it really makes it hard for new people to play because even if they are really good strategically thinking or really good at problem solving, simply not knowing all the information, all the different things that they could throw, what, you know, it's like, if there's lizards and spocks and ten other things, right? If you don't know which one beats which one, you're just, you basically can't win. The other person will throw something and let you see it. Like, I got scissors, I bet you don't know what beats this. <laughs> Shit, I don't know what beats that. Is it another scissors? Nope. <laughs> right? You've got to know that it's rock, right? Uh, it's, now, 
this can be complicated further when one of these components, like in StarCraft, sure, you can let you Zerg or whatever, all these pieces, but there's a skill component. Maybe scissors is really hard to throw because I gotta be like this, and if it's slightly crooked, I don't win. That's true. You think about like a lot of fighting games, right? You'll see like a new fighting game will come out, completely new, right? And one character will just be like, the, everyone's using that character and winning all the time, right? Well, that character is easy to use and really strong. Well, then you see another tournament and suddenly, you know, this other character, people are using them more often. And Everyone's winning with Dan suddenly. What's up with that? Yeah, what's up with that, right? It's some character that is more powerful than the ca character A, right? <laughs> character B is crazy more powerful, but way harder to use. Right? So you need this high level of skill to sort of activate. Right? So yeah, rock beats scissors if you can lift 500 pounds. Right? So everyone goes to the gym and works out. <laughs> really, you know, they can lift 500 now and they just throw rock every time. Right? And now it's just a battle between the rock people and the scissors people are not competitive anymore. Um, you know, there are other things that are rock, paper, scissors don't appear to be. A shell game is actually a rock, paper, scissors. Right? It's I put the shell and I put the marble in one, two, or three and you pick one, two, or three. And but usually in the shell game it's not in any of them because I'm cheating. That's crazy. That's true, but in a fair, nice game, right? And so I say Stratego is a rock, paper, scissors, right? Is the flag near the left? Is it near the middle? Or is it near the right? Right? And you have to put your big army with all your bomb getting rid of guys, miners, also in the left, the middle, or the right at the beginning of the game. And if he puts his big army in the same general area as your flag and you're sort of diagonally opposite from his flag, not likely you're going to win if you both play properly. So there you go. Rock, paper, scissors is everywhere. So if you encounter one... Step one, memorize the whole thing, right? That's it. Okay, so if you're a game designer, when do you put in a rock, paper, scissors? Pretty much every game. Uh, it gives you a nice sort of, it makes games feel very tactical. You feel very accomplished when you build up a bunch of anti-aircraft and you take out those bombers that are coming in. You feel really good when yeah. that happens. Even like World of Warcraft, right? It's like, okay, he's playing that class, I know what abilities he has, I'm playing this class, so I know what abilities I have that are better than the ability that counter his abilities, right? And people freaking love that shit. It's the greatest. Um, okay, so let's move on. Surprise events! Not used often enough, nearly. This is Starfarers of Catan, right? I mean, in this game, there are certain things that can happen where you draw a card, right? And the card will be like, so another player will hold the card and be like, okay, we're gonna do this one, ready? All right, we'll do it. A space pirate uh, attacks you. Do you flee, yes or no? No! You must fight. The second player to your right takes on the role of the pirate. You must each roll your mothership and add your cannons. Is the other player stronger? No! Victory! <laughs> <laughs> Place a trade ship on one of your open spaces. If you played FTL, the same thing happens. You hit random events, but they're not 100% random. There's a set of events. It's like, oh, it's the Space Pirate event. But you, there's like five different flavors of the Space Pirate event, and you pick it something. Maybe you get extra options. Maybe there's a skill component. You have to fight the dude. Yep. But it's basically that, and it's used... Primarily in space games like this. I well, don't know why. Paranoia, uh, not paranoia, um, pandemic, right? You're flipping the cards over. You get True. the surprise events. Like, oh shit, viruses. Well, everywhere. in the next panel, I'll talk about that a lot of cooperative games yeah. and why they need that mechanic right. in there. So, if you're playing a game with surprise events, memorize all of them, right? Uh, we played this game with some people who played it a hundred times, and it's like a space pirate attack. So, yes, they just know everything that's going to happen on every one of these cards. It's only a deck of them, right? Um, but memorizing them is good, but a lot of them have random possibilities, right? Like in FTL. So it's like you have to know that when you find a crazy old man abandoned on a planet, if there's a 60% chance that he'll go crazy and kill your crew, right? You know, you have to know that, and it sort of becomes now gambling, right? When you know the odds. Um, if you're a game designer, when do you put in the surprise events? You put in the surprise events to a game that pretty much, it, it's easy to insert into almost anything. Right? It's like, you, you know, it's just to spice it up. Any game where things are just sort of going flat, where everyone does the same thing every game, right? It's like, you know, okay, on turn one you always do this, and turn two you always do that. You need some sort of surprise. Even in Puerto Rico, there's a surprise. It's what settlements are going to show up, right? We flip over the side. It's not an event necessarily, but it's still this surprise into something that doesn't have other kinds of randomness, right? And the surprise affects all the players equally. It's not like... You know, some random thing where you got screwed because you were rolling dice to shoot and you lost and the other guy rolled dice and he got all hits, right? It's some random thing happens to sort of stir it up so every game is not the same. In Agricola, you, everyone starts with a fistful of cards. That's a surprise event. What seven cards do you start with? 
Right. Now, surprise events as a game designer serve a few purposes. One, injecting randomness basically makes a pseudo catch up mechanism. Randomness is the bane of players who are already ahead. So players who are further behind, like I said before, want randomness just coming all the time. So if you have random events periodically, that serves to sort of keep the boundary of the first place player and the last place player close enough to where the game still feels exciting. So it basically provides a catch-up mechanism. It, all, it also vastly increases the replay value, right? Because you're not going to have the same random events every time you play. Play Master of Orion 2, Space Amoeba 1 game, Crazy Wormhole the other game. But at the same time, it decreases the replayability in that this game, this Starfarers of Catan, is super fun if you play it once every few months. If you play it every day, you're going to get really tired of those events. You'll have them all memorized. All the sort of fun of the flavor text and the sort of non-game elements of it are lost. What's that noise? Oh, anyway. Clapping. There's a theater, like, right there. There's something weird going on over there that was messing with me. All right, so let's move on. Okay. Drafting. Oh, baby. So... The word drafting, right, there's a lot of things that are drafts and people don't realize they are drafts. What a draft is, right, it, for anyone who you know, doesn't get it, is the kickball field. It's, I'll take Jimmy. I'll, I'll take, take Bimmy. Yeah, that's a draft. You have an array of visible things and you pick, right? You see resources and you say, I want that one, I want that one, right? Seven wonders, you get a handful of cards. I'll take this one and you pass it. It's the same, NFL draft. I want that college player on my team. I want that one on my team. All of these things are drafts. In Ticket to Ride, you see five face-up train cards. I'll take a black and I'll take a yellow. That's a draft, right? Drafts are everywhere, right? And when you're a player, all you have to do to succeed in a draft is two things. Number one, you need to be able to evaluate correctly the value of all the things, right? When you're looking at all those players, you have to know which one's better than the other one. Kickball, you get that kid who's been in fifth grade for three years on your team. That's right. <laughs> you know, if you don't know which kid's better, right, you're in trouble. Uh, the order of picking always also matters, which is why Seven Wonders is kind of good because everyone gets cards at the same time and picks. We'll talk in a minute about the different kinds of drafts, like right, different right, ways right. it's done. Uh, the other thing you need to do, right, is not only know the value of any particular one of the items for you, you need to know the value of the items for other people, right? So let's uh, say I see that there's that, you know, really good card, it's a science card, this would give me one point. You also need to know that it's worth seven points to your neighbor who already has a bunch of sciences going on. Now, if you're in second place and that person is ahead of you, denying them seven points effectively gets you seven points. Well, so getting six, that because it would have been one to you, right? So, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> but basically, denying points to players who could beat you is tantamount to victory points in most cases. So it's better to hurt the person who's ahead of you more than get a less number of points for yourself. In general, on average, not all the time. Though. And this is the mistake a lot of people make: is when there's a draft, they'll just pick the most powerful thing every time for them, neglecting to recognize that the second or third most powerful option was actually more powerful than the powerful option to a neighbor or opponent. Right? It's uh, the best quarterback. I could have taken him, but I have a quarterback. Oh, but that other team is in our division is screwed if they don't get one. Right? I'll let him be the backup. Who cares? I'll be one. <laughs> right? Work for San Francisco. <laughs> um, right? Okay, so, you know, there's a lot of different kinds of drafts, right? There's the everyone, you know, sees everyone and you just take turns picking. There's ones where you sort of pick in different numbers. So if you look at settlers, right? It's pick one spot, a second spot. You're drafting the spots on the board when you start settlers, right? It's the first player gets the best spot, the second player, third, fourth gets two spots. And then you go back up, right? So that way the order evens out. Whoever gets the best spot also gets the worst spot. Sometimes when you're doing kickball, it's actually more fair to let one person get the first pick and the second person you get second and third picks, which really outweighs the problem of there's only one guy who's been in fifth grade for three years, right? And there's everyone else is a little kid. But it doesn't work out if there are exactly three kids who have been in fifth grade for three years. No, it doesn't. When you still go one, two, 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 two. is better than one, 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 one right? Um, anyway. Uh, what other kinds of drafts are there? There's drafting in race cars, following on behind someone. Which... That's, that is actually a different kind of drafting. It is different, but is related in one sense. Remember we talked about the left, right, and everything? In Seven Wonders, notice how you pass in one direction, then you pass in the other direction. You keep alternating the way you're passing. If you passed all the cards clockwise, the player to your right is going to have a huge influence on you for the entire rest of the game, and that would really make the game unfun. If you start with science, and then the player to your right just never, ever passes you a science card again, they control your whole game. 
So it has to alternate to make seven wonders make sense, to let you have the ability to try to choose a strategy instead of being dependent solely on what the person to your right is doing. So yeah, drafts are freaking everywhere and they're totally awesome. If you're making a game, when do you put in a draft, right? When you put in a draft, oh, there's drafting in Magic too, right? There's that, right? Same thing. Uh, when do you put in a draft? You put in a draft when you have resources that the value of is not obvious, right? It's stupid to say have a draft where who wants the seven point card and who wants the five point card, right? It's obvious, so it's really boring and dumb to have a draft, right? What you do is when you have a card, this card does this weird thing and this card does this weird thing. Which one do you want? And you want to see if the players can figure out which one is better, right? We have lots of different options that have non-obvious values. A draft is a great way to test the players. Like, do you know which one is better? And then the game is about, can you tell, right? Can you calculate? Now, they also add a sense of fairness to games that have some randomness. A good example of this is a mod you could do to Agricola. Many of you are probably familiar with Agricola. You get passed out all those little improvement cards and the family members early in the beginning of the game and you use those to kind of guide your play. Like advanced players, their strategy is basically dependent upon the two or three of those they plan to build. If you do a draft, Seven Wonders style, of those cards, it removes that random element and now all players have an equal chance of trying to construct their strategy ahead of time. It adds this whole element to Agricola that isn't there normally that doesn't matter to most players but if you played agricola a thousand times that potato dipper is way better than a lot of other cards you could get and having that gives you a better chance of winning but if you can tailor your strategy around other things you can augment the game and continue playing it when it otherwise would have started to feel stale to you all right let's talk about two other things that are basically sort of very draft related right so you have worker placement right a lot of games got the worker placement going on but isn't worker placement just a draft of the jobs right but the difference between worker placement and a straight up, you know, other kinds of drafting is how many you get to pick. Most worker placement games allow you to get more workers. If you see a worker placement game of any kind, priority number one is get more workers. A curriculum, a that baby. You make babies before anyone else. <laughs> Do, fuck everything else in that game, right? <laughs> I don't give shelter, a shit. I only care about that wood so I can build a freaking room for that baby. I only care about that reed so I can build a roof for the baby. I only care about the food so I can feed the baby. Get the baby. <laughs> and then make it work in the fields. <laughs> in this case, building a castle for the king of France. Um, <laughs> All right, worker placement games, you need more workers because then you get more draft picks, right? What's better than more draft picks? All right, nothing. Um, all right, the other thing you have to worry about in a lot of worker placement games is that when you get a pick, right, someone else is going to get something also, right? So Not always, but often. It's a characteristic of worker <laughs> placement as sort of a subset of drafting that usually you're placing workers on things Players may own those things. It's very common in games of worker placement where a player owns the building and gets like some of the victory points or some of the production whenever another player chooses it. Right. So what this does is it interferes with your calculation of the total worth of something, right? If I pick, you know, th this building here, some guy, actually none of these buildings will do that, but if you pick this building and I'll, Rim will get a dollar and I'll get a purple cube, right? Well now I have to decrease, what is the value of the purple cube in dollars and subtract one? Right? Not easy to do, but you have to, you have to do it anyway if you want to win. Now the uh, other characteristic that's interesting that's specific to these is that usually placing a worker for that round denies that building or that structure to every other player. <laughs> Well, I think that's common in all drafts, right? Anytime you pick something, you are denying that thing to but everyone else. But this is else. repeated denial where there's one card. It's, it's like you're doing the same draft over and over and over again, mm -hmm. and there's only one fifth grader who's been in fifth grade for three years. And you get him on every single turn. So suddenly turn order becomes important because that also determines draft order. So you see how these all kind of start linking together in complex games. All right. Another thing related to drafts is auctions. Right? An auction is sort of a draft, right? One item goes up usually at a time, right? And, or maybe in, I guess power grid, there's multiple power plants to choose from, but only one is being auctioned at a time and everyone has to sort of value it. But no, it's not picking, right? This is where auctions are different. You're not picking, you're bidding, right? Now what you're really doing is valuation. You are collectively valuing an asset mm -hmm. that has, you know, it has some real intrinsic value to the game. It's worth a number of victory points in the end, but maybe the players don't know. The players are sort of collectively figuring out exactly how much it's worth. 
So you're doing, usually incorrectly because people suck at auctions. Right. It's very, very similar to the same kind of thinking you do in a draft where you say, which one is better? How strong is that one? That one's seven better than that one, right? But you actually have to come up with a precise number, right? That one is worth 14 because it's plus 4 me minus 10 rim, and that one's worth 17 because it's plus 10 me minus 7, right? You have to really you have to figure out exactly the right number, right? I mean, any kind of auction, right? I mean, there's all different kinds of auctions. There's like, you know, the open bidding, do I get one to it, right? You got the closed fist where you put coins in your fist and then you open it, and whoever has the most gets it, right? You got uh, once around where you say one number and then it goes around and the turn order matters. And, you know, there's tons and tons of auction varieties out there. Now, auctions um, are complex enough to where there are a lot of board games that are just auctions and nothing else. Pizarro is a game where you just bid on a bunch of dudes and they're worth victory points and the game's over. Modern art, you do that six or seven times. Uh, Medici, I think, is, yep. a, is also another game where it's just auctions all the time. Right? Now, it amazes me how often we'll play auction games. So as players, how to be good at auctions actually figure out what things are worth, come up with some way to value these items, and think about it. Do you know how many times we play modern art? There's a painting that's up. We're playing with someone who's played the game before. They know the rules. It cannot be worth more than $30. It physically, $30 is the most it could possibly be worth. And some kid will be like, I bet 35. What's wrong with you? Like, we don't even, I don't know what to do about that. And many of you might be doing that too. I've done it on occasion. <laughs> auctions are actually, it's really hard to value stuff. So get good at auctions and you'll be able to win pretty much any game that involves auctions in any capacity because every other player will be terrible at them. And the, the biggest difficulty of auctions is that you have to value something in terms of something else, right? Sorry. Uh, I saved it. Okay, so <laughs> you might know exactly that's worth five victory points, that's worth six, but you're not buying them with victory points, you're buying them with coins. And you have to know how many victory points is a coin worth. Well, in something like Seven Wonders, there's no auctions, but you know if three coins I think is a victory point. Yep, right? modern art coins are victory points. Right. In Puerto Rico, Early in the game, a doubloon is worth multiple victory points. Late in the game, a doubloon is worth less than a victory point. So you have to know what turn it is, and on that turn, figure out how many victory points is a coin worth right now. All right? Not easy to figure out, in addition to evaluating whatever it is that you're buying. Psychology also has a huge component on auctions. We used to play games with this guy upstate New York years ago where he was very, Scott could troll him to a point that was legendary. So in any auction game, he'd think very carefully and be like, I bid 14. 15. And then you sit there for another minute like, I bid 17. 18. <laughs> this would infuriate him, and he would not let Scott beat him in the auction. Right, and the reason I was able to do this is because before it even started, I had said, that is worth 26. And I would just bid up exactly by one to pay as least as possible, and if it got to 27, I'd say I'm out. But simultaneously, Scott isn't bidding his value because he knows the guy hasn't figured that out. The guy's calculating. This is kind of the psychology. You watch him calculating. He hasn't figured out what he's going to bid. So when Scott is immediately, immediately saying what the next bid is, the guy is thrown off. He doesn't have time to calculate suddenly. He feels pressured. He feels like Scott knows something he doesn't, and he didn't like Scott. <laughs> That's just, I wonder why. <laughs> Sometimes Scott would just bid him up until he'd spent all his money on something worth nothing. Yeah, and it's like you might think, well, I don't have to calculate anything. I'll just keep bidding up by one until everyone else stops. Then I'll have the right number. No, you'll be over by one. Right, you'll lose that way. Don't and you've played Power Grid. If you're off by one in the second round, you're probably going to lose the game if everyone knows what they're doing. I like Mr. Sleepy over here. Okay. Uh, <laughs> let's go ahead. So uh, if you are making games, right, when do you put in an auction? Usually when you put in auctions, it becomes an auction game. It's one of those mechanics that sort of dominates everything else. It's right? like putting chocolate in something. The chocolate flavor overpowers all the other flavors. Right, because basically what happens is even though you might put a lot of other things in the game, like Power Grid has tons of stuff in there besides just the auction, the auctions matter so much in determining who wins that the other parts matter less, right? Like where to put your houses in Power Grid is you put them in the cheapest spot you can. You know, maybe you deny someone a spot, it's not really, right? How much resources do you buy in the market? You buy what you need to power your buildings. You know, do you buy a turn ahead? Maybe if there's a, a lot of cheap resources, right? Not very difficult, right? 
most of determining who wins power grid is the auction for the power plant. Now you also use auctions is if as a game designer, you're lazy and you don't want to figure out what your widgets are worth. Right. <laughs> you know, think about magic cards, right? When you make a magic card, if you're a magic game designer, you have to put in the top left corner of that card how much mana it is to play that card, right? Which means it's up to you, the game designer, to get that right. If you're off by one, you could break the game, right? Someone would be like, yes, this is so cheap. Boom, 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 I win, right? That's why there's no moxes around anymore. Right? So now imagine if every magic card was just sort of like... Question mark. We do an auction for that magic card, right? Now it's up to the players to balance your game for you. That would be awesome. a cool variant. A mana auction. Cards come up and you auction, you bid with your tapping mana to play the cards from a central pool. How much, how do we determine how much money gives? Still one per turn? I don't know. You come up, you give, I will have to come up with it. Game design. Everyone just, nice. everyone <laughs> plays with just a big deck of basic land. They choose yeah. how many of each land are in there, but yeah. you're limited. So it's like you can put more green or less black. And then you have five decks of each color and each player takes a turn picking which deck we draw a card from. And then we bid on it. It has to be a five player game, like the star. Maybe. I don't know. Crazy <laughs> idea. Uh, but yeah, when you don't want to have to balance things and determine what things are supposed to cost, you have an auction, and then maybe if you see over time what people are bidding, you can make a new game, and now you know what the price is supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we got to move fast. Voting. The vote who wins games. The vote rim wins game. It happens a lot. A lot of games you don't realize are simply you sit at the table and you vote who wins. And usually that's me. In disguise. Mall of Horrors, you might as well just sit down at the table and have a little election and say, all right, who at the table do we want to win, guys? And everyone says, I want to win. It's like, well. We were playing this game in Wildwood, New Jersey once. And Scott wasn't playing. He's like on the couch playing the DS game. And every round he just yells, don't vote for rim in the vote who wins game. And they're like, we're not going to let rim win. Uh, yeah, I won. <laughs> so the, basically the, the most basic vote who wins game is the chip taking game right so the way the chip taking game works is everyone has a number of chips let's say everyone has three right so i have three chips you have three chips yep on your turn you vote for somebody that person takes a chip and throws it in the trash right so on my turn i vote for rim i vote for scott i vote for rim vote for scott i vote for rim i went first so rim loses he's out of chips i win i have one <laughs> now we've right. a three-player game we call these political games. They become highly political because now these meta elements matter more. If it's me, Scott, and uh, Joey Jojo, and we both hate him, maybe we're both voting against him. Yeah, let's, let's, let's play with this guy. What's up? I got so I, three, three fingers. <laughs> three fingers. All right, okay. Vote for somebody. Who? Me? Yeah. You lose one. Okay. I vote for Scott. I vote for him. <laughs> Who are you voting for? Yeah. <laughs> I vote for you. I'm gonna lose. <laughs> right? See, I hated Rim so much, I voted him out, thus letting him win, right? I wasn't able to vote for myself to win, and so many games are that game. If you play pretty much any war game with more than two players, because you have two players, you're always voting for the other Let's guy. Let's go one step further. Pretty much any game that has more than two players, or no, more than two teams, because if you have four players, but they're on two teams, it's still effectively two players, where players can directly attack each other. Direct fucking games, as opposed to indirect fucking games, like Agricola, where you can just get in someone's way, in their babies. <laughs> if, if all that can occur, then the game becomes political, because it doesn't matter what my army does, what matters is that I attacked Scott instead of you. Scott is now minus one, and we're both at zero. Who you attack becomes the only thing that determines who wins the game. And almost Unless any... you're so bad at attacking. True. <laughs> you have to be really bad. But like, Mall of Horror is just vote. There's a game where there's rowboats and they're trying to get off a sinking ship, and every round you just vote someone off the island until <laughs> eventually kick them off the rowboat into the yep. ocean. All right, so many vote who wins games. If you're a designer and you want to make a game with voting, it better be a party game. <laughs> Right. Like Mafia is a good voting game. You're you're voting on who to murder every day, hoping that they're Mafia. Also known as Werewolf. Thank These games tend to be very use. social, they tend to be very fun, they tend to be very boisterous, but they're not really good down-level games because the voting just overpowers, like chocolate, everything else. This is why most big serious miniatures war games go two-player, right? We played Battletech with like four players in college. It was really the vote who wins game. Well, Scott, I think Battletech the is a great vote who game. wins game among the players who don't make a forty-ton mech with nine jump jets and nothing but small lasers. Dude, <laughs> you hit someone with all those small lasers. You get to roll the dice so many times. <laughs> One of them's gonna come on headshot. Yeah. Meanwhile, I'm backed up into the corner. I have a mech that only has armor on the front, two Gauss cannons, a targeting computer, no jump jets. I'm just backed up like this, waiting. <laughs> all right, let's, let's keep.
keep moving. We're running out of time. We're only 10 minutes, and we got more slides. Okay, trading, right? And so trading, what happens when you trade with someone in a game, right, is you're basically boosting both of you plus one, and everyone else stays the same. Settlers, right? right? That's what happens? Right. So if you think about it, when you play settlers, first place guy trade with fourth place guy. Well. You know, assuming no one rips anyone off, right? It's an even trade. Because if you rip someone off, someone made a mistake. Don't get ripped off. And if someone's letting you rip them off, sure, but that, what are they, what's wrong with them? Um, if you make an even trade with someone, assumingly the only trade you would ever make, you're boosting both of you up. First place and fourth place. Why would fourth place guy do that? It only gets in the third place, and now your first place guy is almost guaranteed to win because you're even farther ahead. Second place guy is not going to trade with first place because first place is already in his way. Yeah, all that does is hurt third and fourth place guys by putting them even farther back, right? Third place guy and fourth place guy trading. Third place guy doesn't want to fall even farther. You know, it's like maybe that helps them catch up to second place guy. Watch professional or like tournament level settlers play, and you'll see that no one trades with anyone ever. People don't trade unless they're ripping someone off. One of them doesn't know what they're doing, or two players are attempting to king make, or they're gonna try to trade with each other and just blow everyone else behind, and then it's a 50-50 shot which one of them wins. This is a game called Genoa where you can trade anything with anybody at any time, right? Uh, Bonanza is a game that's not pictured, is the best trading game there is. Because basically what it is, is when you draw these two beans every turn, and you can either take them or trade them away. But if you take them, they might hurt you, right? So a lot of times you draw and you are forced to trade because it's basically, it's a landmine for me, but it's a cookie for him, right? So now suddenly trading gets good. People want to trade. So yes, desperately take away this landmine from me. All right, it's a cookie. Awesome. So Thank as you. a designer... Trading games, you want to have some sort of really powerful incentive for people to trade. Otherwise, smart players on the player side won't trade unless they're ripping someone off. And unless you're smarter than all your friends, they know you're ripping them off and no one trades. Okay, so let's move on. Chicken, right? This is a chicken as in two people are driving a car at each other. <laughs> Right? And are you gonna stop or are you gonna veer out of the way? Right? Uh, brinksmanship, is, uh, people use that term, is a similar mechanic. Right. And a lot of the times you see this is basically it's, it's a good way to mechanic in a game to stop the situation where someone is way too far ahead, right? Or someone is about to win, there's a way to stop them, right? So you see this if you've ever played uh, uh, Chrononauts, right? Well, Chrononauts has a way where if someone's about to win, if you just disturb enough of the timeline, there's a collapse and everyone loses. Right? I would rather lose with all of you than let you win. Exactly. <laughs> right? So, you know, this is a game called, uh, what's the name of this game? No Thanks. Right? Where you pass this token thing around and it's basically, you know, worth, it's a bad thing. You don't want to take cards, but you, in order to pass a card to someone else, you need to put a chip on it. So you're putting more and more chips on it. But the chips are worth points, so you might want to eventually take it. You're basically playing chicken of, I don't want to take this. Are you going to take it? No. Oh, it's getting better all the time, though. If you pass it around again, I'm going to fucking it, it take keeps it. Getting be it yeah, it keeps getting better all the time, but it's still bad to take it, right? But you need the chips. Uh, so if you're a game designer, when do you put in chicken? I think chicken is a great way to balance momentum games, right? There are a lot of games where somebody will snowball to victory, you know, and it's like, you know early on they're going to win, right? It's over before it's over, and you didn't put in an ending mechanic where it ends at the right time. So you have this really boring mid to late game where, you know, we know who's won, we're just playing this out, guys, right? If you put in some sort of chicken, you know, destroy the world mechanic, right? I'll just crash into you, I'll kamikaze, right? That really keeps things interesting, keeps people in the game, because they'll just go near the big red button, and all of a sudden the winning players will back off, and then they can catch up again, <laughs> right? And if they try to get ahead again, red button. Take turns by the red button. Now, chicken, right. because we, you're going to miss the next panel, a little aside. With chicken games, there's a way to guarantee you're going to win. If we're throw away actual the steering chicken, wheel. Actual chicken. We're in cars. We're going to race. I can threaten Scott say, I'm not going to swerve. But that doesn't mean anything. I mean, it's a threat. I don't want to die. So all I have to do is look at Scott, rip my steering wheel out, throw it away. Now I can't swerve. And what if we simultaneously pull our steering wheels off? So, <laughs> thus, chicken forces an escalation of mechanics, an escalation of strategy, where now the game of chicken is really who can rip their steering wheel out fastest. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're running out of time. Uh, tile laying. There's a lot of tile laying games out there, right? Tile laying games are really all about Figuring out, you, you draw a tile and you put it somewhere in this sort of, you know, geographic space. You're making a board. You're making a, a gamer. You're making some asset that's usually shared by all the players, but not always. Not always. It's all about being able to tell 
how much just like sort of drafting, right? You can think of your drafting the geography, right, almost. So if I put this tile here, it's worth X points for me and X points for somebody else. Right? Or maybe you know, crafting the land in this way will get me some points in the future. And you need a lot of spatial reasoning, especially to get farmers in, in freaking Carcassonne like Rim does. I can't do it. I don't know what he's up to. Um, trick taking. There's tons of trick taking games. I've run into six people at PAX this weekend who have never played a trick taking game before. Yeah. Hearts, Euchre, Whist. Funny old guys <laughs> play it, right? Uh, what trick taking is all about is you know everyone plays something, right? That does something, and then someone takes all of it. Some trick taking games you want to take tricks. It's like, ooh, I want, I played the best one, I get them. Sometimes it's I don't want to take them, like hearts, right? You take them. I want to play the weakest. In a way, thing. it's almost a subset of an auction. It's like a simultaneous auction, but usually there's rules about what you're allowed to bid with. Do you have to follow suit? You know things like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, so when usually trick taking dominates an entire game, but I think there's a lot of potential for a designer to make a game that involves trick taking that is not just, you know, boring old euchre, right? Like you look at something like Memoir 44, the Command and Color series, where you play a card to order your troops, right? Well, what if everyone simultaneously played a card to order their troops? And the card did something, but it all, there was also a trick-taking aspect. So the more the card that does something more powerful on the battlefield is weaker in the trick-taking game, so it balances out, and whoever takes the trick gets some sort of bonus. Well, like right? Grimoire has a really almost a mechanic like that. It's not a great game. It's got a lot of mechanical problems, but you have a spell book for spells. The more powerful spells go at a lower initiative. They go later. Yep. Or a higher initiative, depending on what version of D&D you played. Yeah, Citadels <laughs> has a similar mechanic, right? Where yep. it's like, you know, okay, I can play the Warlord, but he goes last, right? Not so good, Warlord. Other people are going to hit you before you hit them. All right, dexterity tests. <laughs> Pretty much, if you have a dexterity test in your game, it's jungle speed. And it's funny, Stormtroopers playing jungle speed because they have no dexterity. It'd be um, funnier if it was the shooting range. Yeah. But anyway, if you put a dexterity test in your game, it now becomes a sport. Right? Uh, that's pretty much all there is to it. If there is any physical aspect to determining who's going to win or lose the game that actually matters, uh, it is a sport by definition. Uh, so when do you put a dexterity test in? You put it in to a game where you want to test dexterity. And that's pretty much all it there is to it. It can be used as a sub-mechanic. Like there's, there was a game, I think called you know, Catacomb or something, where it's like a dungeon crawler, but you use flicking of little bits. Like you flick like your when fire you shoot, when you shoot like a magic missile, you get three little purple dots, and you go pew pew pew, <laughs> and you actually have to make them hit the monster when you flick them. So right. take uh, I don't know Arkham Horror or Castle Ravenloft, and it's, mix it with Crocodile. It's Crocodile plus Ravenloft, basically. Um, but if you're good at that mechanic, it's the same as if you're playing Counter-Strike. It doesn't matter how much strategy the other guys use. If I'm better at clicking on heads, my <laughs> team will win no matter what. Yep. <laughs> uh, dexterity tests are the best, at least tabletop-wise, for uh, party-type games, right? You're not getting serious people, you know, you can't really get that good at, you know, flicking these tiny little purple... I mean, Crocodile is a little more precise. Well, you can if the game's about that. You're going to dedicate yourself to that just like you would any But sport. you require such precise craftsmanship to get anything that will behave consistently. I mean, even bowling alleys don't behave consistently based on, like, the waxing and stuff, right? So no one can really build up a consistent skill. The professional bowlers don't get 300 every time, even though all they do is bowl every single day of their lives, right? So Jungle Speed, you know, the fastest grabber, right? There's not going to be any consistent skill there, right? It's better for a party game situation. Alliances. Oh yeah, everyone's favorite. So alliances are sort of like voting who wins, except when you're voting for someone to win, they're winning with you, right? If you're just playing a game like Risk and you say, let's ally, that's not, there's no, nothing in the rule book of Risk about alliances. Zero. Nothing's nothing. It's not a real rule. Game just, theory is a non-cooperative game. Right. Only one person wins at Risk in the end. That alliance is bullshit. It doesn't exist, right? You don't have to honor it. Nothing's stopping you from just killing them, right? But in Eclipse or Dune, right, the alliances are real. It's you can't attack the other person who's in the alliance. If you do, there is a severe penalty for doing so. Even right? Steve Jackson's Illuminati. There's a way to have joint victory with one or more people. And that's awesome because otherwise it's almost impossible to win that game. Right. <laughs> so if you're playing a game that has real alliances where you actually are forming teams of the other players, think of it like voting instead, right? Think of it like a parliamentary election where you have to form a coalition, right? You want, it's better to win on your own, of course. 
right? Who wants other people to win? Nobody. Uh, <laughs> but you want to win with as few other people as possible, right? So you look and you say, okay, this board of eclipse, if, I'm, if blue and red go together, we have more than 50% of the Starfleet power of the universe, galaxy. Let's just do that because then only two people will win. Right. Now, alliances can become highly political very quickly. In, in Doom, you can form arbitrarily sized alliances. Everyone but Scott might form an alliance. We all win immediately. <laughs> Scott just loses. Ha ha ha. The end. <laughs> but, uh, for example, Eclipse has restrictions on how big alliances can be and mechanics around it to force alliances to still be fairly even so it doesn't just become political. It also becomes intrinsic to the game. So when do you make, if you're making a game that has an alliance situation, right, when would you make the alliances official versus just sort of letting people do whatever they want, like in Risk? And pretty much it's, if your players are making unofficial alliances, you should probably have an official alliance rule. Your game was sort of begging for it and letting it be unofficial will create all sorts of unhappy game experiences as players, you know, ally and, and you know, traitor each other. It's much more satisfying to do those things when there's a game mechanic enforcing it, right? When you traitor someone in Eclipse, you get like this negative victory point card that's like, traitor, right? That's way more satisfying than just, you dick. Yep. You said you were going to dick, right? It makes a lot of upset players, right? But having that traitor card, no one's going to get upset. It's going to be totally awesome instead. All right, one more. Traitors. And we're not talking about, we're not talking about the alliance traitors. We're talking about these co-op game traitors you keep seeing, right? That guy in Shadows Over Camelot who's not trying to get the Holy Grail. Or, you know, that Cylon hanging out in the Battlestar Galactica, right? This surprise person who's supposed to be on your team that's not actually on your team, right? In a game with a traitor, most of, I think every single one of these games that I've seen, it's usually obvious who the traitor is, right? Because what can the traitor do? They can A, they can play to win for the good guys. Well, they're going to lose then because they're the <laughs> traitor, right? Two, they can play somewhat suboptimally, right? They, you know, try to look like you're trying to win, but do a little bit of crappiness sometimes so that people don't think you're the traitor so obviously, right? And it's like, okay, but I can tell if someone's playing suboptimally, right? Even if just by a little bit, it's obvious, I right? I mean, you guys play Pandemic. Usually, two people at the table know exactly how to play optimally, and they're just telling everyone else what to do. Like, no one else needs to even be there. So if someone in Shadows Ever Camelot is resisting the player who says the right thing to do, either they're an idiot or they're the traitor. Right, and you know the people you're playing with, I guess maybe not a pack, so there might be some strangers, and everyone's smart here, right? Yeah. Uh, but you know, the table you, know your, you know your friends, you know who's stupid, and if you know the stupid guy's the traitor, well, that's going to be really easy to get the right answer. Uh, you know, but, and, and look at this, you watch these games. They don't let you communicate. They restrict how much you can signal between yourselves, because if you're all cooperative, there's no reason not to share all the information you have. There's no reason in the world and even if the trader's there, whatever, if everyone shares information, it is mathematically certain that you'll figure out who the trader is. So as a result, these games have to restrict communication to make this trader mechanic even work. Mm -hmm. I really and the trader mechanic's only there to keep the game from being almost not even a game. Yeah, I mean, you have the Lord of the Rings game where like someone has to become the traitor with like getting the one ring or whatever. The game that you have like a 0.1% chance of winning anyway and some bit can ruin it for you at the end. <laughs> exactly, but they win by themselves, don't they? Yes. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, why do I bring this up? Because I don't think you should use this. This is really dumb. This mechanic has not been used very well because it tends to dominate the game. People play Battlestar Galactica and they really only care about the traitor mechanic and possibly trying to space them. Nice. People don't really care about the rest of the game usually. So I think you shouldn't use it at all. If you're playing, it's obvious who it is. Just call them out however early it is that they, you know, it is obvious who it is. I think there's potential here. Trader mechanics are fun. Everyone wants them. Everyone likes them. They're just very rarely implemented elegantly, and they overshadow the rest of the game. Shadows over Camelot, if you're the trader, you're like, yes, I get to play the fun game. <laughs> Pretty much. All right, I think that's all the game mechanics are going over. It is all the game mechanics are going over. Woo! We went four minutes over, but we're next, so it doesn't matter. <laughs>